I'm Lynn Pinson, and um, I'm a, a certified wellness coach, wellness consultant. My background is exercise physiology. Uh, my undergrad degree was in home economics education, and my emphasis is nutrition because I think it's probably one of the most important things that we can do for our body, nutrition and exercise. They both kind of go hand in hand. Um, I appreciate you all coming because osteoporosis is a huge disease and unfortunately we don't often realize um, the significance of it until we are later in our years and we have one of those bad bone um, DEXA scans and say wow um, I should have really been taking some action and I would have loved it if I'd have had a half of a class of 20 to 30 year olds because that's the age they really need to get with the program and, and start preventing it. However, I'm glad you're here to learn about it and what we can do because, boy, things are changing right now. And if you've been um, watching the news on the drugs and that type of thing, um, our options are changing and not so much toward the pharmaceuticals anymore. So anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but Mike Teeter, who's running the coffee machine, <laughs> is um, he and I do this presentation. He's the owner of Exercise Institute and um, he will talk a lot about the exercise portion and um, the impact that that has on our bones. And then Michael Bennett, who works here at Pilgrims, will be kind of our mid-speaker and she's gonna talk about some of the supplements. Um, she is a great resource when it comes to finding the natural supplements, the natural, um, especially the plant-based, calcium, and um, some of these new Bone Girl pot products. I think she's also going to have some samples for you to take home and to try. So anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about bone physiology so you can understand what goes on in our, um, our bones and why these um, risk factors, medications, and calcium sources can impact it so much. Our bones, how many of you have seen a, a, a real skeleton? Okay, they are, I mean it looks like these bones are just really hard, stiff, not unalive I guess you'd say, um, pieces. But they're not, they're actually very much alive in our body and they're changing throughout our life. You know, when I, even when I took physiology, I don't think I realized how much our bones change throughout our life, but they are constantly breaking down and rebuilding. And when they do that, we have two types of cells in our body. And these two cells are impacted by what we eat, how we exercise, the medications we take, um, and that determines the amount and how well they do in their job. The two types of cells, the first one is osteoclasts. And our osteoclasts are the ones that cleave the bone, they break that bone down. So um, they are important. Many drugs, however, reduce the function of that osteoclast. The osteoblasts build the bone. And these are great, and we need to have enough of these so that we're constantly building that bone up after it's being broken down. Um, so this whole process is called bone remodeling. And we replace most of our skeleton every 10 years. I mean, I don't think most people realize that, that our bones are being broken down and reformed completely in about every 10 years. Did it work? Great. If you need a handout, Mike has some, so just raise your hand and he'll bring one to you. Um, what does osteoporosis look like? Well, here's an example of um, osteoporosis, an osteoporotic bone and a normal bone. As you can see with the osteoporotic bone, there are big holes in that. And those holes are inside, it's a matrix, it's inside the bone. And those strands um, get to be broken down, there are big holes created. And over time, as we can see, we would start to develop this, this curving of the spine because of the little fractures that are occurring in that spine and then the way it, it heals in. So our bones are not as, as strong. It's all, osteoporosis also, is also called the silent thief um, because we don't know that this process is occurring. You know, we go along for many, many years and think we're doing just fine and all of a sudden we might have a 
fracture, we might have some pain, um, we might start developing a little bit of a hump, and we had no idea that this was really going on inside of our body. Our bone density is the greatest in our early 20s. And at that point, it's kind of downhill for our bones, you know, as, as the process continues. It doesn't have to be, but unfortunately, it is for a lot of people. Osteopenia. How many of you have been um, diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis? Okay, osteopenia is the thinning of the bone. That's the first step in our, in our process toward osteoporosis. Um, and that's, that's a wake-up call, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't get their DEXA scans done when they have osteopenia. They usually wait until, unfortunately, they have osteoporosis. But osteopenia, osteopenia occurs due to imbalances in that remodeling. Uh, we have too much bone that's broken down or maybe too little bone that's being built. And part of that has to do with what's going on in our life. It might be our nutrition, it might be medications, and it might be our lack of exercise. As far as the statistics go, hip fractures are gonna occur in one in three women. Now I just heard a, a statistic a couple days ago that said by 2020, 50% of all of the people will be at risk for having a fracture. That's a lot. So this is a disease that's affecting more and more younger people as well. Um, and, but within that, one in three, 15% will, will die and 50% will require long-term care. So it is really concerning. Here it um, kind of shows how it's increased over time. Back in 2002, there was only 43.7 million. It has grown in 2010 to 52.4, and at 2020, it's supposed to be, what does it say, 64.1. Does that surprise you? A little? No? <laughs> well, it probably will surprise you less when we look at the risk factors. 68% um, of those affected by osteoporosis are women and some of those risk factors, and you'll have to note that there's actually two pages of risk factors because there are so many risk factors. And that's why we're seeing on that slide where it's growing so much is because there's so many things that impact our bones and puts us at risk for osteoporosis. The first one is being thin or having a small frame. And as I look around at the women in here, I've got a lot of small framed women. Um, and unfortunately, that puts us at a higher risk. If you're Caucasian or Asian, especially if you're European descent, that's another risk. Um, if you have family history of osteoporosis, how many of you have family history? And I do as well, you know. Um, but, you know, it's especially severe if, you, if they've had a fracture, you know, after the age of 50. But I just look at family history be, and then you add in all of the risk factors that are occurring today because of our lifestyle, it puts us at much higher risk. If we are postmenopausal, if we went through menopause early, um, we're at a higher risk. And what happens during menopause is, and this is, you know, we always say, oh, during menopause, we are, our risk goes up. Well, what happens is your bones start to re remodel at a double rate. It, it's much quicker. So you say every 10 years our, our body, our bones are being remodeled. Well, it's going to be every five years. And so it really increases that rate of remodeling. And by women in the early 60s, it triples. So we really have to be careful and we really have to pay attention to what we're doing, our nutrition and our exercise and our stress and that type of thing during those time periods. If you have abnormal absence of, of your period or um, especially athletes, if you've been an athlete and went through any period where you had amenorrhea, that puts you at a higher risk. Um, there's also certain medications. Yes? Um, being thin and small, why? Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, when A, when you are, okay, when you start out, you're already small boned. And then when you're thin, I always, <laughs> when I used to do my um, osteoporosis education classes, I would always say, this is the one time that the heavy people can cheer because when you carry around a lot of extra weight, it puts a lot of extra stress on your bones. When you don't carry around a lot of extra weight, we don't have that extra stress on our bones. So, it just think of it as constant weight lifting if you're heavy. Yeah. 
So that's, that's why it is. Um, medications. Uh, we see, you know, a lot more medications are being prescribed today. And if you look at the list, you probably go, hmm, I've been there. Um, it might be um, glutic uh, any of the steroids. Um, cancer medications, anti-seizure medications. It also includes, and we'll get into them a little bit more, but anything for um, maybe some uh, stomach type thing. Um, also, I was going to say, any of your medications for asthma, your inhalers, any of those steroids, if you've had steroid injections. Um, and most people, if you, if you ask, how many people have had a medication for asthma or had an inhaler for asthma. You see more and more kids, especially today, and we see it even in the adults. More of them are being prescribed, and that is very hard on our bones. Um, if you have a low vitamin D level, how many of you guys have had your vitamin D checked? And how is it running? It was low. It was low? Everybody I know who has had it checked initially, low. Um, and then has had to supplement. My husband, for instance, he just went and got his physical done. And he was kind of one of my guinea pigs in one of my classes that I talk about. I, he initially had a, a vitamin D level of 24. So I've been, you know, putting vitamin D in his smoothies every day. And so I had him get it checked again. It only moved 10 points. He's only up to 34. And his doctor was kind of going, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. I'm like, oh, it's better than it was. You know, we just now need to double what he's taking. Um, and so often that's it. If your doctor says 1,000 milligrams of vitamin, no, 1,000 IUs of vitamin D, um, that's usually enough to just kind of keep you where you're at, barely move you up the scale. So if you're really low, you might think about that. What should it be for? Um, a no, um, you'll see that 60 to 100 in that range is a good range. So um, if you're in, the, I've seen people at 9, 10, 11, um, he was at 24, now moved to 34. But if you can get it up there to around 60, it's much better. Same for men and women? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if we've had a sedentary lifestyle, and you look at our, our population today, and we are very sedentary. We don't work out doing things that you know we used to do 40, 50 years ago. So if we sit at the desk, if we don't actively exercise, if we don't actively, actively lift weights, we're at a higher risk as well. If you're not getting enough calcium or, um, I also talked about physical activity, but we'll talk about calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D and the interactions of those three. And that's really uh, critical as well. If you're consuming two or three ounces of alcohol every day, that puts you at a higher risk for osteoporosis. If you're a soda pop drinker, um, soda pop is probably one of the worst things that we can do for our bones. So getting off a of soda pop is very important. Um, and if you're not a dairy product consumer, you know, we have a lot of lactose issues. People say, I just can't, I just can't eat dairy products. Um, but I always say, if you can take, you know, some type of enzymes um, in order to do that, you're going to be far better off. And your cheese and your yogurt actually absorb better than your just straight milk does. So if you're good with yogurt and cheese, which a lot of people are but may not be able to drink milk, then choose to do that. And smoking. Smoking is probably one of the biggest risk factors for osteoporosis because it blocks the ability of um, the use of estrogen, calcium, and vitamin D in that whole bone structure. And you'll, I don't know if you'll notice, but a lot of smokers are very thin and they end up with osteoporosis. Most of my pulmonary patients had osteoporosis as well when I was doing pulmonary rehab. Um, estrogen deficiency in women. That is probably you know, we talked about this whole menopause thing, but that's one of the things that probably gets the most attention. And what actually occurs is we see that accelerated bone loss because it's an accelerated bone remodeling. And women, estrogen is needed in both men and women's body in order to produce bone and to make um, in that remodeling process. Um, and when we go through menopause, we see that estrogen declines. And when it does, uh, we just cannot build bone back up like we can when it's higher. Younger women who 
stop menstruating because of maybe amenorrhea with athletics or anorexia, also have comp compromised bone density, and they never develop probably the peak bone density that they could have. Um, and if you've had maybe cancer or any type of um, female issues where you've had to have your ovaries removed, you, there is a, a big increase in um, fractures due to osteoporosis because of the removal of that you know, hormone producing organ in the body. Men, and we'll see, we see this more and more as low testosterone in men. And the problem is, is um, when that testosterone goes low, we don't realize that it has an impact on our bones as well. Men need both testosterone and estrogen for bone health. And what it does is it converts the testosterone into bone preserving estrogen in the body. And so that's how they build bone back up. Um, and then, of course, we have the original risk factors of alcohol, smoking, steroids, um, sedentary life. All those affect men as well. And men have about one in six risk of having a hip fracture. But I would say, tend to say that statistic is maybe a little bit out of date as we venture forward because we're seeing, again, more and more um, people with osteoporosis due to the variety of risk factors there is. There are. How many of you have had any type of thyroid, parathyroid issues? Okay, this um, in itself can become a, a real problem when it comes to osteoporosis because those parathyroid, um, parathyroid gland regulates the growth hormone which um, you know, regulates our bone density, the bone breakdown and the bone creation. And so these kind of orchestrate how calcium is used in that bone breakdown and that bone buildup. Um, when we have that hormone that's out of balance, uh, we have more breakdown and that calcium cannot be put back into that matrix again to, be, to rebuild the bone. And that's why we see uh, lower bone density. You also see that in hyperparathyroidism, um, there is a, a calcium loss in the urine. We actually, our bodies will excrete the calcium instead of use it in the bones. It's being flushed out. Yes? Does that have the same as the hypothyroid? I think it happens more in the hyper okay. than the hypo, but I know if you are on Synthroid, because this is a worry for my, my daughter is also hypo. I, I don't drink um, anything now, but when I was younger, I did. Mm-hmm. I, I think it does interfere a little bit with the okay. uh, bone building. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, so basically when we have less calcium that's being absorbed, that means we have weaker bones. And our growth hormone, which is actually um, in this product right here, act, the growth hormone is needed to build bones and to be, build stronger bones. But as we age, our growth hormone actually goes down. And so again, Less of this is being produced in our body, and, and um, it creates less bone density as well. Okay, medical conditions impact on the bone. So we talk about the thyroid hormones. Um, but make sure if you are on thyroid, like a Synthroid, that you do get enough vitamin D, you do get some good weight lifting and exercise, and that you drink enough calcium and make sure you have your magnesium and stuff there as well. Um, genetic diseases also like cystic fibrosis cause bone loss and also digestive diseases. Um, and those digestive diseases like Crohn's disease, um, irritable bowel, those type of things, we see that there's an interference with the absorption of calcium and those nutrients that actually build bone. So if you, plus you're taking a lot of times steroid medications or medications that might interfere with that. So you kind of have a double whammy right there. And abnormal calcium excretion also contributes to that. Did you have a question? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> um, and then there's some people that we find, in just genetically, they don't trap calcium in their bones like they should. It just, it, um, it, 
kind of flows through that matrix and it doesn't it doesn't get stuck in the bone in that matrix to create our our good density. Here's our list of steroids: um, our um, hydrocortisone, glucocorticosteroids, and prednisone. And those are the ones that increase um, bone breakdown. Our anti-seizure drugs are also linked to bone loss. And then um, if you've been through cancer, oftentimes they will use a drug to suppress the estrogen. But this, um, this medication, zoledronic acid, is one that they give people to help reduce that bone loss. It may not help build bone to where you need it, but it'll help reduce further loss. And then there's also um, uh, cancer-related bone loss as a result of either tumors or toxicities due to treatment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about sedentary life. How many of you guys have an exercise program right now? Good. Does it include, does it include um, some resistance training or weightlifting? Okay, good. And do you find that you have improved your strength or have you seen an improvement with your bone density due to that? Okay, a couple people have. All right. Well, let's talk about why that's so important. We'll start talking about, first of all, what happens when we are sedentary, and then we'll talk about why the exercise is so important. But bones, like muscles, weaken if they're not worked. So if you're not putting the stress on that bone, um, or the muscles which are attached to that bone, then we are not st uh, stressing that bone to help rebuild. And the more stress we put on it, the more and the better it builds that bone as it's being remodeled. Um, early astronauts, this was one of the, probably the eye-opener that, wow, um, we've got a problem here, but early on in the whole um, uh, astronaut history is we saw that these people who went up to the moon or into space lost a lot of bone mass because they were weightless. And it was like, wow, what's going on? Well, if there's not that gravity and that pull on, those, on, the, on your bones constantly, we are not getting um, the effects that we need to in order to rebuild the bone as it's breaking down. So we see people who might have some paralysis. If you might be stuck at some point in a wheelchair, um, if you might have muscular dystrophy, even if you might be in a cast or on crutches, you'll often see that bone become weaker. And, um, but you can remodel that bone by increasing the stress on that area later. And um, you can actually rebuild that stronger as long as you, know, you have the, the tools to do that. The nutrition, the exercise, the supplements, that type of thing. Okay, so has everybody here had a DEXA scan? Men included. It's not too early. What should I say? Not too early to get one done. Everybody should have a baseline. Doesn't matter what your age is. We had um, several men from our study last year who uh, did the DEXA scans, and I think there was two or three of them that ended up with osteopenia. So they were right in that zone of possibly, you know, having osteoporosis. And um, it was an eye-opener. I don't think they expected it at all. They just were kind of curious because we had this great deal. So um, if you can get a baseline scan, get one so you know where you're at. And I encourage men and women alike, know where you're at so you know what kind of work you got to do. Um, but the DEXA scan, the problem is if you've looked at it, it only shows the outside portion of the bone. It doesn't show that internal matrix, does it? And that's how, that's how it determines your density. Well, it may and may not be the most ideal test for that. I mean, I think it gives us a good idea, but um, especially with some of the medications that we've been using, like the Fosamax and the, um, that type of thing, it's actually given us some, some probably positive false security with that. Um, so some of the new imaging techniques that we have out, 
will actually be able to look inside the bone. And you know that first picture that I showed you with the matrix so you could see you know, the holes and things in there? Um, now we'll be able to see that. And if you happen to have a CT scan done for any other medical purpose, ask them if you can get any type of bone information because CT scans can actually see inside there as well. Why and don't they just do a CT scan? what's that? Why don't they just do a CT scan? Because it's higher, much higher radiation. Oh, okay. So um, DEXs are great for for that initial screening, um, but down the road, I think there's going to be some other tests that we're going to find is much better for determining that. Another one that they're looking at is biomarkers, so that they can actually take a look at um, chemicals in your blood and your urine and determine how much calcium and things are, um, are in there due to the rate of bone remodeling. So that should be a help for us as well. And then um, bisphosphonates. Is anybody on uh, like a Fosamax or an Avista or any of those? The doctor prescribed it, but I'm not starting it. Okay. And I tried to I tried to plug in this little, and I'm not so technically savvy, but this little news clip, and it was from the ABC. And if you just write it down, the ABC News, um, and I think it was on about a year ago. Um, one and they a couple weeks ago. they did. And the one a year because I watched both of them. The one a year ago was um, a little bit, it, it showed more. I mean, it showed the women in their x-rays and what they were doing and stuff like that when they had the spontaneous femur fractures. But what happens with this medication we're now seeing is, okay, doctors prescribed it. They said, oh, this is great because it would slow down the osteoclast, the sloughing of the cells. It would increase or maintain the osteoblast. But what was happening is those bones are becoming like a vase. They're really hard on the outside, but there's nothing in the middle. Our structure in the middle has disintegrated. And so people would walk around and, you know, maybe jump or, you know, move something and boom, have just this, and your femur is the largest bone in the body. And they would have spontaneous femur fractures that end up like this. So what we're seeing now is that the FDA has put out a warning about these. And it says it may raise the risk of a thigh bone fracture. And they have said that um, you shouldn't take them for any longer than five years. But my question is, well, what's going on in that five years? Is it actually a safe thing to be doing because you were not actually building bone correctly like we need it to? So um, I think, and Mike, you had mentioned, had you read about the class action suit? you have a little bit to tell well, about just, it? it the, uh, I'm kind of from Idaho, fifth generation. The poo's going to hit the fan because there's now there's a lot of movement of just to not to take the prescriptions all the way off the table. Mm -hmm. the, the side effects and the main risk are because 95% of those thigh fractures were. You type it into search. That's the first thing that pulls up is the lawsuit. So, yeah. The, yeah, it does. So um, I know my mom had quit taking it before I had read about, about this. And then um, after I read about it, I thought, oh, good thing she quit taking it. But she was still on it for probably 10 years, so, which puts her at a higher risk as well. So anyway, um, I am going to have Michael, do you want to come up and talk a little bit? Come on up and join me. We'll talk a little bit about calcium. I'll do a little bit about calcium here. She can talk more about... Um, the different types of calcium. Um, but our bones, to start with, are the reservoir for calcium. And, and as we go through life and in different stages, especially as nursing moms, um, our body pulls from those stores for different things. And if we're not taking in enough calcium and our body needs it, it will pull from our bones and we'll have a, a negative reservoir. So we need that. We also need constant calcium in the blood and a lot of our organs and nerves and muscles depend upon it because it's needed for all those, our heartbeat, our muscle contractions, and our nerve um, sending messages. Um, so when it gets stolen from the storehouse, again, we have some problems there. And um, the other thing that we need it for is our acid alkaline balance. And I'll talk a little bit about that after Michael talks on the calcium. 
But that's quite a big chapter in the Chris Johnson book, is the whole acid alkaline balance in our body. And if you don't um, know about it, it's, it's something we probably need to, to uh, take a closer look at. Um, but anyway, our new calcium recommendations are somewhere between, depending on your age, somewhere between 700 and about 1,300 milligrams a day. However, the upper range for tolerable amounts has been set at up to 1,000 to 3,000. And here are some food sources for calcium. Again, cheese, yogurt, milk, cottage cheese, kale, broccoli, almonds, tofu, and black beans. And I'll let you talk a little bit about some of those other calcium sources and our supplements. Okay. So there was, and um, what was that recommendation based on? Food based or? Um, um, I would say more dairy. It was probably based, it's the RDA based on dairy products. On, on food yeah. diet. diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study that was done in 2008, the British Medical Journal which taught, had women taking 1,000 milligrams of supplemental calcium a day for five years. And that type of calcium is calcium citrate, calcium carbonate. Those were the two primary ones. And then they had a, so there were two groups, a take, one taking the citrate, one taking the carbonate, and then the third group was taking a placebo. And over the five years, the two that were taking the calcium, their, um, their risk of heart attack was increased by 50%, I believe was the amount. Because the body was having such a hard time absorbing that form of calcium that it was building up in their arteries and in their heart. So they had a, a much higher increase of heart, heart disease, heart attack, which is a large killer here in the United States as well. So there's been a big trend in food su in supplements towards food-based calcium. Algae Cal is probably one of the more popular ones, which is in a lot of different cal uh, food-based calciums. So the vitamin code, uh, raw calcium, and the grow bone both have the algae cal in them. Does this one have the algae cal? I forgot I'm the other sure. one you were telling me that I should have picked up. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was going to have you get K2, the life extension K2. Okay. It's um, on this back wall, kind of in uh, two or three in. Okay. Yep, past the pro. No, okay. that's it. I'm not sure what they're using in this. And oh, yes, they're using the algae cal as well. Algae cal is a very popular uh, form of, of plant based calcium right now, it is derived from an algae source. And, but there have been a few uh, issues lately with high uh, iron and mercury contaminants in it. So they're working that out. But um, so it, there's just a few sources of the algae cal that are having a few issues. But they should be working those out. So uh, Garden of Life is very particular about where they get their products and how they formulate them. So this, they actually we have a free book called Raw, uh, The Raw Truth which has a whole chapter on food-based calcium. I should set this down. Uh, it has a whole chapter on food-based calcium, particularly the grow bone. They did a clinical trial, a six-month clinical trial with women, and there was a significant increase of bone density in that time with the grow bone. What they're doing here is the raw calcium, which has the, uh, the algae cal, of course, but it also has a blend of several other nutrients, which I'll talk about not just with this one, but also with the bone strength to take care vitamin C, vitamin D3, which is very significant to help with the absorption of calcium in the body. Um, vitamin K2, which helps with the metabolism of the, uh, the calcium in the body, especially uptake into the bone. Um, and calcium magnesium, of course. And they've got a few other things, plus a blend of fruits and vegetables and some probiotics, which also help with uh, digesting the vitamins as well. K2, which I don't think you have any information on the K2. I don't. So, and I'm trying to get to the right place here. <laughs> I'm sick, you need to revise your D3 because it, right now it looks like there's not much sunshine and it's almost June. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's a year-round thing. I know. It is a year-round thing here. <laughs> yes. Uh, and usually, you know, around this time we have a lot more sunshine. It's I know. so I know. discouraging I right now. Extend it out a little bit. 
um, which D3 will help you not be so discouraged about the lack of sunshine. <laughs> Don't depend on tanning booths, sir. That's true. Oh, That's yes. true. Uh, okay, so K2. This is one of my favorite K2s that we carry. Of course, we have several other different ones as well, and we are carrying more than we did, what, six months ago or so. And uh, the, this does have some K2 in it, but the Bone Strength Pick Care has a K2 that's derived, it's, it's a specific one that they have um, patented for themselves alone. And, um, no, actually, their calcium is for themselves alone. So the K2 they're getting from natto, which is a soy source, but natto, it's fermented soy, and natto kinase is really good for heart health. If you're not aware of that, it helps uh, with cleaning out the arteries as well as um, helping with the uptake of calcium. So I have a study here. Let me see details here real quick. 2004. So they had people on K2. This is a Rotterdam study. People on K2 with the, um, did they have it with calcium or not? It reduced the risk of coronary disease by 50%. So even if you are taking the calcium citrate or the calcium carbonate and you took a K2 with it as well, rather the form, form, a food form of the calcium, this would make up for that 50% uh, increase of heart, heart failure, um, that rate in heart failure, that was the other study, that taking the K2 brought that uh, risk of heart failure down by 50%. How much K2 do you think? Um, no more, I think it's around 100 milligrams. I take a, a new chapter, but I take the multivitamin. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, the new chapter, let's see. K2 or whatever. They might have the K2 in there. There is K2 in there. Yeah, okay. and it's the same one from the NATO. Yeah, we went through okay. that. I went over that with her earlier today. And yeah, the K2, actually, I was thinking of another. So this has 400 microgram, uh, 45 micrograms in it. Okay. How much does the multivitamin have to you? I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. Maybe about that, maybe a okay. little less. Um, this is specifically for the bone. Let's see how much they're doing here. Yeah, see this is two milligrams. So um, I would say this is one of the highest ones and they're getting it from three different sources of K2. They're only doing one. So, which is the one that they're using is proven to be a higher source. Uh, let's see. They don't really say where the K2 is from in this one. So I'm not certain where they're dragging their K2 in the Garden of Life one. And they are deriving theirs from natto as well. If you take too much of it, it can clean up. You know, it, it's an enzyme, basically. It's got enzymes and probiotics in it, which help break up any kind of calcification, any kind of buildup in any of the arteries. But it also creates that, um, it stimulates the, the osteoblasts, which create bone cells, the marrow cells. And it suppresses the osteoclasts, which causes sloughing. So you have healthier bones because of that, but you also have healthier arteries. So no matter what calcium you're taking, because you know the calcium citrates are a lot cheaper than these food forms that you have here. Taking a K2 is going to be very, from all the studies that have been recent in the past 10 years, this is going to be really important to take either way. So, and how much did you say of the K2 do you need to have? Um, I would say this is the highest one that, we, that you should take. I think the other one we have out there that's high is 2,000 two MCG. So about 2 milligrams oh, okay. max would be what I would take. Um, but once again, talk to your doctor and see what they say. And we do have some really good naturopaths that we can refer you to as well if you would like a more natural, if you're with a, an MD who's not very natural minded and you'd like more of a natural opinion. And I do have an open bottle of this if you guys want to take me home. They do recommend uh, three tablets of this a day and um, they're small tablets. They're really nice and they're, you can crush them up as well. With this, I believe it's two... Uh, three in, with breakfast and two with lunch because they're capsules and so they're a little they're not as dense as the tablets so k2 and I will pass uh, do we have do you have any questions about any yes which of the vitamins might interfere with someone on coding? especially the K 
Um, I would go with the more basic, well, Coumadin might actually help. I mean, the K2 might help with the Coumadin or not. Vitamin, is it a vitamin K? Yeah. Um, which vitamin K is clotting, and um, so that's, they're warned not to take vitamin that's K, what I or even vitamin K containing, like, isn't kale, broccoli, spinach, spinach you know, some of those green vegetables. Um, well, you know if what? they're deriving it from natto, though, yeah, it's going to be more thinning. Form. Right. Exactly. Because it, it's, um, it, it is for breaking up the, the, any kind of buildup in the arteries. And you know what? I read something about that there is a form of vitamin K you can take. I cannot. We have that. an interaction book. So yeah. let me go grab that while she's yeah. talking, and, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that gets a little... Dicey to try to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. We have we have several other different ones out there. That these are the highest quality ones that we would, if you came in um, on the floor, we would recommend these. We do have a few that uh, now has one that's algae cow with magnesium and vitamin B three, and it's a it's a cheaper one. And you know, so they're sourcing. They don't have a lot of information about their sourcing or their blend. It's just a really basic one. Oh, one thing I did want to talk about. The recommendation, usually they say 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day for women, and that is, that's based on the citrate carbonate theory, but with the food, uh, you, you only because absorb about 20% yeah, exactly. <laughs> of those calciums. With these, you're going to absorb between 75 to 90% of the calcium that's in here. And that's why you look on the back and it says calcium 756 milligrams. So you don't need nearly as much because you're absorbing a lot more of it. So a lot of people look at that and go, well, it's not 1,500 milligrams that my doctor said I should take. But there are a lot of factors to consider there. So. Do you want to talk a little bit about Jordan's yes. book? Yeah. yeah, so the there is a chapter here. And I might have said that when, I, I think I, I mentioned it when you are Gone, oh, oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. But this is a free book that we have, and he talks a lot about the food-based and the different uh, ways that, you know, your body responds to the food-based supplements. But once again, he also does recommend getting a lot of it from your diet. And I did hear a statistic this morning in a training that I did that a lot of women, because we eat dairy and, you know, fruit and all this different stuff, we get about between five and eight hundred milligrams of calcium before lunch or by lunch mm -hmm. every single day in our foods. And uh, we may not be aware of that. And so, you know, if we're losing bone mass, then there's something else going on. It's not just, and so having all these other nutrients, which in our body are supposed to be helping with that absorption is going to be more important than just throwing some calcium citrate at it. So. So yeah, we've got lots I have of a question. If, uh, I do take calcium citrate, and if you take that, and it has like the elemental is 600, mm -hmm. is that what you're getting, or is that even less than? You're getting about 20% of that, 600. and it can build up. Uh, so what would that be? What's 20% of 600? 120. How much? 120. Is it 20% of 600? Yeah, 120. Yeah. 120. <coughs> Um, so yeah, about 120 milligrams. Of Even though it says the elemental and the doctor wants me taking 1500 a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you. Um, so yeah, there's only a 20 percent absorption rate of that, and whatever you're getting from the okay. food. And it can not only build up in your arteries, but it can also, if your body's not absorbing it, it can uh, deposit in your joints. I know a lady came in and she had heel spurs because she was taking large amounts of calcium and she had to stop because she started getting heels first from calcium buildup in her heels. For men in particular, um, build up a, a kidney stones and uh, which are calcium based kidney stones can be pretty predominant if your body's not absorbing it correctly. So, which 20% isn't really great. But also if your body's not eliminating it correctly either, exactly. having trouble with, with your digestion. And you don't know so. this until you have issues? Right. Yep. <laughs> Yep, exactly. So, so yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay.
I will go grab those samples and um, I'll be around to answer right. questions. questions. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, we'll talk a little bit about vitamin D and then we'll talk about food because that's what I like to talk about. Um, vitamin D, it's a critical vitamin. How many of you are supplementing with vitamin D? Oh, yay! I don't think I've ever seen 100% in my classes, so that is good. But as you know, a lack of vitamin D not only affects our bones, but it puts us at a higher risk for diabetes, depression, colon cancer, MS, um, so a whole variety of really not good illnesses. So it's really important that we do supplement, and apparently you probably have all been to the doctor and had your tests done and at least know where you were at that point. And then I always say get a follow-up test because the only way you can tell if you're getting enough is if that number is moving into the right zone. Um, all right. Well, so I have a question. Yes. When it comes to calcium, if it says you're getting 1,000 IUs of vitamin D, are you actually getting 1,000? You are. Um, and is your body absorbing that all? It probably depends on several factors, too. Um, but I would say more so than calcium. calcium. Okay. Right. Yeah, you don't have that 20% like you do with your okay. calcium supplements. But like I said, um, 1,000 basically kind of keeps you where you're at. Oh, I'm on 2,000. Okay, so that's, that's better. Plus I'm outside now. <laughs> yeah, which I still don't think the sun actually produces anything in our body up here. Okay. <laughs> but anyhow, um, let me go back to, I'm going to just go back to the food slide real quick um, and talk a little bit about... Well, maybe not. We'll just leave it on strength training. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, acid and alkaline balance. Um, I know I asked you if you had heard of acid and alkaline. Basically, what this, this um, theory is, is that when we eat certain foods, um, there is hydrogen atoms that are either donated or that are taken. And that produces either a more acid effect in our body or a more alkaline effect in our body. And there's also other things that produce more acid in our body. For instance, medications, especially prescription medications, and stress. So when we get at a more acid state, um, our body has to pull calcium out of our bones in order to neutralize it because our body wants to stay kind of at that, at that neutral zone. Um, there are certain foods like, you'll be surprised, lemons limes, grapefruits, wheatgrass, barley grass, um, pineapple, watermelon, raspberries, um, tangerines, kale, parsley, all of those are very alkaline foods. They'll produce alkaline effect in our body. You wouldn't think that taking a very acidic tasting thing is going to produce an alkaline effect, but it does. And then eating things like high protein, um, even milk, meat, um, any artificial sweeteners increases the acidic level. Um, all of our like soda pops, energy drinks, coffee, um, alcohol, ice cream, cheese, lobster, fast food, uh, fast food burgers, um, Are meats. You at my food log? I, you I did food? acidic. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, those type of foods produce more acidic. So if we eat majority from that side of the chart, we are pretty much in an acidic environment most of the time where we are actually pulling calcium out of our bones in order to neutralize. So that is another one of the big risk factors um, for us in developing osteoporosis, even if we, didn't, we only might have hit one or two of the earlier ones that we talked about. So I gave you this food target, and some of you have this at home from my previous classes, and some of you have probably seen it for the first time. This is Chris Johnson's, and I have two of his books here. One is his cookbook, and one is his On Target Living, which I think are great um, because it puts it in such easy, easy to read, easy to learn terms. But he created this target, and it's kind of his answer to the food pyramid, because he said, you know what, that food pyramid is it very helpful? And it really doesn't talk about the quality of foods. It just talks about servings of foods. And you can have a whole variety of quality out there. So if you look at it, and um, if you are eating a lot of things in the red zone, you probably also are eating things that are probably not only damaging to your health, but damaging to your bones. 
So what he wants us to do is to eat more to the center of the target. Um, and you'll note that some of the things that are very good for our bones, like our sea vegetables, our wheatgrass, our barley grass, um, pomegranates, spinach, sweet potatoes, parsley, all those things in the vegetable and fruit um, area, as well as it's important too, I think, to have our good healthy fats because our, our fats are really important in a lot of the processes that occur in our body. And then again, our proteins. We need protein as well in bone and muscle building. So eating from the center of that target, not necessarily just from the green, is kind of an 80-20 type theory. But I say the, f the more we can venture into the zone, the better off as far as our overall health is going to be. And then you'll notice on the back, I think everybody has a picture on the back, is the um, rest and rejuvenation and exercise target. And so this will kind of lead into Mike's talk about exercise. Um, but um, utilizing this type of target, if you're not sleeping enough, if you have a lot of stress in your life, um, if you're taking prescription medications to sleep, all of those things will affect your bone health because we become more acidic and more stressed and that actually reduces our bone density. So getting more in the center for our rest as well as and relaxation. If you don't have one, I can give one to you here. And um, can you yeah. one up to you? Sure. And then um, also for the also for the uh, um, exercise as well. And you know when we do our exercise, I always say two more. Um, you want to. If we're going to do it, make the most of it. I, I, that's kind of my theory in life. If I'm going to take the time to do it, I want to get the most bang for my buck. So I want to know how to do exercise right. I want to know that it's being effective for my body. I want to enjoy it. And I want to know that I did the best job while I was doing it. So in that, we'll let Mike go ahead and talk to you about strength training because it is the answer for bone remodeling and bone development. You guys got a few more minutes in you? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Eat, eat, oh, maybe, and then we'll get up and stretch when yeah, we get... If you want to stand up for a second, too. I, talking about all this whole food, eating wheatgrass, reminded me of this joke I heard. It's a do-good lawyer who's driving by and he sees his family out in this yard eating grass. And pulls over and goes, what are you doing? He said, well, we're homeless, we lost our home, can't afford food, so we're eating grass. He goes, oh, that's a shame. You need to come to my house and eat. He goes, really? Oh, yeah, hop on in the car. He goes, yeah, but my wife and kids are here, too. They're underneath the tree. He goes, oh, bring them, too. He goes, wow, you're so great. This is awesome. He goes, oh, man, you're going to love my house. My lawn is at least two feet. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so how do I advance this? Oh, you hit it. Thing? No. No. Go ahead. Oh, the enter button. The enter button. Go okay. ahead and hit it again because you okay. might be a little stuck. Well, it's, I'll it's get mad you in a minute. So, uh, oh. well, anyway, hey, you had two really good talks tonight from experts. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm just a practitioner. But I am going to offer a little, I'm going to tie some of this together a little bit about this. What, what I, when I here think about this stuff, I think about when you build a house. Anybody build a house here in the last few years? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming you try to make, pick the best products. Yeah. You want it to last, right? So I think that's a, that, that's a wise thing and um, it can enhance the strength training immensely. However... It's uh, comparable to if you came to me and you said, I'm so excited about getting a suntan. I've got all these money. I've spent all these hundreds of dollars in oil. What, you think this is okay? Do you think this oil is better than this? So I go, hold on. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, you've got to quit standing underneath the moonlight. You have to understand the stimulation that causes the thing. Then the oils may be more effective. So um, I'm going to just kind of flow with this a little bit. But, you know, we talk about life expectancy. My wife is from, family all from Butte, Montana, and up until... Like 1942, the after life expectancy of a male is like 44 years old or something crazy. The mining industry is very hard. You know, you're, we're farmers by generation. Her, hers is still farming, ours is not. But um, we talk about physical activity being good for you. you go, yeah, but last time I checked, you know, you, you work yourself to the bones. You didn't live that long. And uh, now that men are living longer, then we also have to be aware of the osteoporosis risk. So, and another thing too, other advances, you know, in, in the health mar in the health industry is that um, I, I think the current age now is 80 years old, from 72 to 80. They say by the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be 99 years old, whether you want to or not. So my question is, how, how do you want to be when you get there? This? 
You know, do you want to be carrying a, a, a cane or a golf driver? You know, do you want to be pulling a golf bag or an air tank? So keeping your quality of life important is, is, is throughout, is, 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 I think is huge, but um, call it good enough. Not all exercise is, is, is created equal. So philosophically, I'm here tonight to help you separate your little circles a little bit from, a, from an exercise versus recreation. Let's separate the two activities, okay? Walking's great, but you're not gonna ever build any significant bone mass from it. Matter of fact, if you walk a lot and you're not eating right, you may even enhance and increase the amount of bone loss you're having, okay? Let's talk about the other thing, it's exercise, the resistance exercise. Um, more specifically, the method I'm gonna talk to you, to, to you about a little bit here. Um, the history of what I'm gonna share with you is I'm super slow certified, I was super slow certified in 1992. I've never exercised more than 12 to 15 minutes a week since 1998 and I never worked out more than 20 minutes a week since 1992. So we're talking, I train every seven to 10 days, nothing in between. Um, <clears throat> this was born out of, the, I don't know how, uh, uh, sorry, English, second language. <laughs> out of the Nautilus Corporation, one of the chief engineers for equipment design had uh, been commissioned to supervise uh, an osteoporosis research at the University of Florida in 1982. And during the study, he noticed that w women during the study were very irritated by weight training. They got a lot more injuries, and they also uh, showed poor, poor control. So what they did was they said, well, let's start with light weights. Let's teach you a really slow movement so you can concentrate and get good form. Well, what, that, what they found was, was when they eliminated the momentum of the movement, that the, that the, uh, the results got 50% better. You also had less irritation. Since 1982, things have come along the way till here we are in 2011, where to us, you know, exercise, strength exercise is not good for you. It's the results that you desire, okay? So it's kind of like a tool. Use it to get what you want. Um, Having stronger muscles, and I'm going to go through the slides and explain a little bit of this. Having stronger muscles, I call it the chassis. Your muscles attach to the tendons, the tendons attach to the bone, the ligaments that keep the bones together. You can't have strong muscles on weak bones, you can't have weak muscles on strong, I just said that, and vice versa, okay? And, and we basically, if the stimulation is correct and global by nature, then you, you will get uh, uh, results all along the, the system. And with high intensity slow speed training, you get results in all six categories. Flexibility, cardiovascular strength, endurance, uh, bone mass increase, and muscle. I have a whole slide presentation on advanced training techniques and how much more muscle you get than traditional training. That's what we're here to talk tonight. I figured we would just glaze through this a little bit. I'm gonna sit down now. Um, with this method of exercise, there's a, a book I recommend if you wanna read or go to the website. Body by Science by Dr. McGuff. He's an emergency room doctor. He's been training this method for 20, 25, 30 years, as well as some of my mentors uh, as well. Um, and there's some pretty cool uh, DNA research coming out that uh, not only can you reduce the difference in strength between the younger groups and older groups, but you can actually reverse at the DNA level, which is pretty significant. And just in that amount of time that I said that. And of course, what I like about what I'm talking about is this something you can carry on for, for your life long time, the tra strength training. Um, my mentor told me, you know, when he was 20, and I kind of relate, when you're 20 and you make a mistake in the gym, it lasts you a couple days. When you're 30, it lasts about a week. When you're 40, it lasts about a month. And after 50, it just doesn't go away. And so I think we need to address uh, uh, this issue from safety a little bit. So uh, moving along here, um, I think I covered that. Oh, did I get this arrow right? No. Side, side arrow. Side arrow, thank you. Towards the wall. Side arrow, towards the wall. No? I hope you get the copier fixed. You can help me get the computer going. There we go. Oh, I was using that arrow. This way. Okay, wrong arrow. I, I just lost my credibility now, so can't even run on that computer. So, Mike, when you were talking about the DNA, are you saying that possibly strength training can help? High intensity strength training can help repair then tighten the coils. And in the back of that book, he makes sight of that, that research study that they do. He says it should be on the cover of every magazine in, in, the, in America. There's never been anything done that can, that's shown that kind of uh, stuff. Um, I, like I said, I'm a practitioner, and I started the Exercise Institute in 1995 after I realized that I need a, a, a private work environment so I could take one client, one training through in a private room that was 65 degrees at Fahrenheit on low friction equipment, put every bit of data into the computer. Because if it's not, another thing about your strength training, if it's not progressive, 
and you're not moving forward and evaluating it, your, your body's going to stop changing. It, matter of fact, it, it takes a lot of resources to build muscle, and if the body doesn't have to do it, it won't do that. For, for example, from a metabolic example real quick, a pound of muscle, I'm sorry, a pound of fat can hold, a pound of fat can hold 3,500 heat calories of energy in storage, and it takes two calories a day to hold that in storage. One pound of muscle requires about 35 calories a day to stay alive. So from an efficiency standpoint, you know, if I can get away with two pounds less of that and, and store more energy, it's like, you know, if you're a businessman, you're like, I'm, I'm not using that piece of equipment. It's cost me 35 bucks a day. I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm going to store money in my savings account. So uh, muscle is, is, is the engines of our body. Matter of fact, uh, you know, yeah, they say the heart is a muscle. Yes, it's a heart, but it's subservient. It provides nutrients to the muscles. So here's what happens as we age. Uh, between the ages of... Um, 25 to 45, the average loss is about a half pound of muscle per year. But by the time you get to 45, that's over uh, three quarters or close to three quarters of a pound of muscle uh, lost. And Lyndon made that comment earlier, especially with small women, if you're losing that, you're taking a load off of the bone. Secondly, she also made a reference to the NASA study, which, by the way, NASA has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in research how to get back that bone loss. So whether you're an astronaut where you leave gravity and you lose 13% in three months, or you're going to lose 13% over 30 years, the solution to repair it is the same, and that's high-intensity strength training. They found that short, brief, and intense workouts were the best thing that they've ever looked at, including drug therapy. All right? Um, I'll go into body composition. We also know that you know, as we get a little older, our, our body fat also increases, and um, that's not really what you're here to talk to about tonight, but strength training also can increase your fat loss if you have a dual uh, objective. Um, I've already explained this, but I kind of walk it through. Is it, I always like to say that exercise is wasted on the youth. I don't really mean that because kids need exercise, but when you give a 25-year-old 10 more percent strength, he goes, oh, I just benched five more pounds. Big deal, right? But if you give somebody over here in this point 10 more percent strength, you're, you're, you're not, I don't know if you can read this, this color probably needs to be changed. Here's kind of an average life from 25 to 85. Here's your genetic potential. Just like in, in real estate, they say location, 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 and exercise is genetics, genetics, genetics. Whatever your potential is, as it is. But here, if you're active living, you start to fall between 45 and 65. And it's kind of, it, it kind of coincides that by about the age of 40, women now start to record a 2% bone loss each year from 40. So you think back up the muscle loss for about 15, 20 years, it kind of makes sense now that there's lightening of the loads, therefore the, the, whole, the whole chassis can become uh, uh, weaker. And then, of course, I mentioned earlier, do you want to carry an oxygen tank or not? You want to, you're, you're not going to keep that line from falling, but it would be nice to to kick it up a notch and drag it out a little bit if possible. You know, uh, some accidents and diseases we really can't do anything about, but um, uh, kind of a quality of life assurance plan. So this here is an MRI cross-sectional slide of a, of a female. I forget her age. I think it was 50. Um, I do know that that is 42-day difference from day 1 to day 42. You'll notice that the... Can everybody see this all right? Mm -hmm. This is the subcutaneous fat around the, the thigh. Okay. This is the muscle, and in the muscle is the marbling as more body fat. Okay? And then here is the femur bone, the bone that's been getting a lot of attention tonight from the abnormal thigh fractures. This is not a shadow effect. 42 days later of high-intensity progressive resistance exercise, there's already a darkening of the bone. Because that matrix is filled in. It's, it's the whole, that's a whole chassis, your, your ligaments. This is why pro, pro athletes strength train, because they, enhance, they, they reduce their risk of injury. Now, they increase their performance, but they also uh, increase their tensile strength so that their ligaments may, uh, are, are more, have more stamina and endurance. So, but it, what's, what's amazing is, is that the thigh didn't get bigger. Gals always worry about that. They get all bulky. It didn't change in the, in, uh, the, diameter. the diameter across here. What happened was, is the body fat was metabolized inside the body fat to make space for more density in here. And so you're a little heavier, but your size, you know, so. Um, anyway, so that's just a pretty powerful of what happens. Um, 
I've already talked about this. You can reverse your age 15 to 20 years. This is what this research showed in age. Um, and actually, um, if you want more, um, another re uh, a good reference is Dr. Miriam Nelson is a, is, a, is a researcher with Tufts University with women's issues. I think she's written like nine books, but I know of at least three are like strong women stay young, strong women stay thin. Um, and so she has a lot of this. She found that when she took away cardiovascular exercise from women when they were dieting, that the fat loss actually got 44% better. And of course, Jim Karras, who wrote Cardio Free Diet, has also been finding that to be true too. But um, you also get a significant increase in strength because you're not, you understand the cause and effect here. L last example I, I think I should give is um, did I talk about sun tans or calluses? Okay. Strength training to produce an increased muscle mass density, t stronger tendons and ligaments, and stronger bones is essentially the same protective mechanism. That's all it is. It's a protective mechanism in the body. The skin is the largest organ in the body, right? It also has two protective mechanisms that would be similar to building bone, bone and muscle, and that's a callus or a suntan. When you're working in the garden and the skin encounters a friction that is of significant threat, it will then reinforce the skin by making it thicker to protect it from tearing. Notice that that model of healing and repair and building doesn't take place during the stimulation. It takes place at the time after the stimulation has enacted it. So that's why when I say strength train for a short amount of time, rest, let the body grow, because that's what's happening here. Um, a suntan. Isn't it funny that 15 or 20 minutes in the sun can be healthy? You extend that frequency out and, and, and duration out, then you become risk for blister and bleeding. So, and once again, tickling. Tickling the skin is not a threat to the body. It feels good. It's go, that's why I look at it as, as aerobics and, and steady state physical activity. It's a stress outlet. It's social. It's fun. It's enjoyable. It makes me feel good. It's like putting your face up against a warm lamp. You know, It'll be warm, but it's not going to cause a suntan, right? So you can, if you train hard, you train brief, and you rest three or four days, and then you do it again, and you track your progressions, then you'll know if you're truly making uh, any gains or not. <coughs> um, another uh, gentleman I've had many phone co conversations with is, uh, he, was a, he was at Baylor University when he'd done this research. Uh, he's a cardiologist, and he's on the Board of Medicine, and now he's at Texas A&M. But he had taken five cardiologists who had also done some work with high-intensity training. They found significant improvements in your good cholesterols from, from doing this. But he also found in postmenopausal women that they were increasing their bone mass 1% monthly. Now, Tufts University, Miriam Nelson, who I think if she started training a little, she trains similar to what we do, but if she take the whole leap, she'd even get better results. But it's at least plus 2%, which is 100 plus, per, well, it's more than 100% better than minus 2% a year, right? So whatever, uh, everything I've said is between 2 and 12%. Um, and your Fosamax was only... One percent. I mean, it basically kept your bones from decreasing versus actually building. And mm -hmm. now we know, you know, the bad side effects. So, strength training is far better than any of those medications as well. I have on my desk. Uh, like I said, I'm not the expert. I'm a practitioner. I have mentors that are experts, so I get all the information from them. But I do have five testimonial letters on my desk because over the last 15 or 20 years, we've we've had uh, two dentists and three hygienists who've trained with us and wrote, written us letters because the hygienists refused to go. They were all, had osteo, one had osteopenia, a couple had osteoporosis. They um, did not want to get on the Fosomax because they had seen what it does to the bones of a jaw of females. And um, they all had not only um, improved their bone mass, but they got their, into the normal range. Um, and then I have a client who I've started training. She was 1996. She had a stroke three years earlier. And I think she's 80 years old now. Anyway, she, her, when we first started working with her, her, le, her right leg was an inch and a half smaller than her left calf. And now there's only about a quarter inch difference, and she still not perfectly walks. But she improved her bone mass. She was full osteoporosis. She improved her bone mass 7% in that first year. And now uh, 12, 10, 10 years later, she's, uh, she's still um, in that range. So... Um, and of course, like I said, it, it, with, with, with what we do and what I am a proponent of, whether you do it, I'd always like you to come train with us, but if you pick up on this protocol, it's much safer because when you're moving slower, you're not doing a lot of impact. 
You know, Newtonian physics says for every, every, uh, every reaction there's an equal and opposite. There's a reason why treadmills are the number one machine broke down the health clubs. Because your knees pound it and it pounds you, right? Back and forth. And it full, the metal rubber, the, the, the um, treadmill finally break down. So, as a matter of fact, the CDC on their website, 70% of people who run will be injured next year. So to me, that's a poor return on my investment, right? So I like to pick things that are recreationally fun, but strength training in a slow, controlled manner. And uh, being a former runner and somebody who's done every exercise thing out there, you know, I haven't had any issues with uh, bursitis or knee problems ever since. So, um, and if you're a golfer, guys, uh, I don't know if you guys golf now, but uh, 15 to 20 yards longer than you drive in about the first six weeks. <laughs> that's for scratch golfers, though. So maybe further if you're not as good. Yeah. How about straight? <laughs> Can't guarantee that. If you find that solution, you call me because I, I really, I just turn this way a little more. No. But anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more benefits to strength training. I mean, everything from improved GI transit time, so your colon cancer decreases, um, HDL improvements, glucose metabolism. I mean, your muscles are your gas tank of your body, and you, you can deal with blood sugar drops much better. But like I said, you have to be very strategic in your strength training. And you, have to, and you have to move it forward in progressions in your intensity, in your workload. But, and and as that range of motion one is, is important too, Mike, because as we get older, you know, we find that you know, we aren't able to move as much as mm -hmm. well. Um, we find that we have... My analogy to that with range of motion is, is, it, is uh, it, um, like a sponge. You take a fresh sponge out of its plastic wrap, it, if you notice it's about an inch and a half thick, and it's squishy and moist, and you squeeze it and you twist it and it goes back to its shape. But you, you, after a while, it sits on the counter, it gets dry and it, it shrinks, it gets hard and cracks and then curls up. A lot of people, and, and men, men, I would say, men, men are you know, um, yield signs, women are traffic cones, so when we're working with lumbar and cervical work, you know, women have, we address in that upper uh, shoulder area, it, a lot of gals get real tight back there. That's, that's actually a, a related to muscle strength loss over years, too, because your head weighs about 12 pounds and it sits up there all day, see? So those muscles get tired. You can improve that, and men typically in the lower region. Um, but uh, so, yeah, when you, when you weigh stronger muscle, branches more capillaries, it can deliver more blood to that area, so it's more loose. It's, it, if you're training a full range, range of motion, you enhance your range of motion to its normal, you know, to normal, and you repair, you re-heal re re faster from bruises and injuries and such. And um, the last thing I forgot to really, really hit on in, in, in closure, and I'll ask, answer some questions, maybe do a demo of what I'm talking about, because in seven minutes I can give you a full workout like you've never had before, using just some body weight stuff. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. I always said, is it Tom? Is it, is it Tom? Is that right? Yeah. I, I always thought about that when you walked in. I go, man, you should go now because it's, no, I just can't. But uh, I, I like to sit down and think about, you know, it, one of the things I'm, I admit, when I started my talk, I talked about something that means anything and there's all this confusion. It be, it's, it's really easy to understand why you read a magazine one month and it tells you to do this and then the next month it tells you to do that if they don't really have a clinical definition understanding what it is in the first place. So I love Sally Field and God bless her, but when she's sitting there going, and pharmaceuticals have locked in on this too, by the way, oh, when diet and exercise isn't r enough, take this drug. And I'm like, well, have you yes. thought maybe that diet and your exercise isn't the right diet and exercise? Ask your doctor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you put your doctor on the spot. He's going to go, no, yeah, go ahead. Just take it, take it, take it. Get out of my room. I don't have liability, right? And that's, uh, anyway, um, I, I would almost, I almost sidetracked myself there. Uh, and so I, I'm like, yeah, yoga, uh, we talked about the yoga. You know, that, there's great. There's a lot of stress release, a lot of feel better, and you're with the social, but it ain't going to cut it when it comes to strength, okay? You've got you to get in the weight room, and uh, you don't have to be there very long, like I said, you know, short and infrequent, but you need to get there. But when we think about how do you really build bone mass, if you just think about it, break it down, if, if we didn't strength train, we, I guess we could look at it like if I had a machine, I know that if we could make little fractures along the bone with a machine, little, put a little more force than your bone can deal with, and then stop along the bone, we could actually heals back, it heals back stronger, right? Um, I could drop you from a building. I could increase the progression of that. But then you get the compression forces, which would increase, yeah. I, not very practical. Um, you would get end site bone increase, and that, that's where that's where like physical activity doesn't pull, doesn't fulfill the total picture. It'll help a little bit, but it's mostly site specific because walking is really just falling against gravity. Most of the load is in the joint, not the muscle. We were engineered to be efficient in how we burn energy, not inefficient. 
If we were inefficient, we forget to eat breakfast and we walk to the mailbox, we'd starve to death, right? So we get better at using energy than not. But anyway, so walking, you get site specific. What you need to have, though, is you need to have a torque on the bone against the tendons to, and, and increase the weight load of it. But that sends an electrical current through the whole bone, basically, that signals it to start the remodel process to thicken up there. So that was kind of a part I probably should have talked about earlier. Um, well, normally when I, I like to talk about this, I, I understand when I'm, I'm speaking uh, that 80% people don't exercise on a regular basis. Don't worry, the 20% that do, 80% of them are doing it wrong, but so at least you're not that category. But uh, they say the number one reason is lack of time. Number two, lack of reason, lack of knowledge, and then lack of support is number three. And that 50% of the people who join a club are gone in six months. So I don't know if you've ever been those, uh, you know, stop start people. That's why I said procrastination. Hard work pays off after time, but laziness pays off now. So my call to action for you is is get that strength training, get that card, get a professional. Um, American Council, uh, President's Council on Exercise, 150% better results if you work with a personal trainer. But if you don't, at least get the system down and get started and stay started. So. Um, <laughs> I forgot that's a slide, sorry. <laughs> Live longer, stronger. Train, I already did it. It's not about old, it's about growing strong. There we go. So I, I did a double close on you. So. Normally I said I don't have an eloquent closing, but there we go. All right, so I'll just open up for some questions and uh, make them easy for me, please. What do you do in 15 minutes? Um, total body, actually. You work. It's, it's more complicated than the answer I'm going to give you, but essentially 21 days to, to learn a habit, 42 days to maximize skill, 100 days, and you got it, right? So I want you to get really good. The Pareto's Law of 80-20 says 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of the exercises. So you basically can do three or four movements that cover total body. Uh, a, a body squat, a wall squat, or a leg press of some kind, depending on you have, have knees, there's other things you can do to modify that. Um, um, some kind of a pulling. Huh? With machines? You, and you can, uh, okay. My, tell them about your. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you how we're laid out. Okay. Is if you have a machine, which, see, our muscles don't contract in a straight line. There's a specific, like if we all stood here and every one of us on this planet did this, it's funny how the bicep just magically comes to the mouth <coughs> to eat and to look at stuff. So a machine that's been designed by an engineer to mimic that movement is pure because we're stronger and weaker throughout that range of motion. So variable resistance on low friction equipment is ideal. So yes, correct machinery. There's only three or four brands in existence that are any good. 70% of the machines made today still violate patents of Nautilus and Medix. So, and even Hammer Strength, which is pretty good, used to be Nautilus Midwest. So there's, a, there's just a handful of companies that are really on the right track and stuff. But once again, you can train good on bad equipment and it's better for you than training bad on good equipment, right? So you don't ha if you don't have uh, machines available to you, now our facility, like I said, is laid up clinical. We do everything for you. It's turnkey. You walk in, we do full assessments. She does a wellness coaching for us so that you get your assessments, your plans. We have body comp technology, which, by the way, um, if anybody's interested, uh, just you can call any one of our three locations, Liberty Lake, Hayden, and Riverstone, Coeur d'Alene. You can get a free week. You can meet the team, see the facility. Try the, try the equipment. Tr tr go through, actually see what it is we're talking about, and then uh, no, we're not a pressure place. You know, If we're on the same page, we'll go to work for it. Like I said, we're a health asset management firm. I picked that up from a financial planner. Because we basically want to manage and navigate through that adversity. Oh, I'm oh. Just running, yeah, running, running. So, something that the machine has. Yeah, okay. you do that. I do that too. Yeah. Leg extension, leg curl, pull up, chest press, row, and then, ab, yeah. back. That's what I call the foundation. Yes. But then I'm also really big on cervical and lumbar, which we have machines in all our locations so that you address that. Because the spinal column women is the hardest place to get the bone mass increase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to move that that way. And a lot of clubs don't want the liability. But you need to get in and slowly and safely work the lower back and the hip so you can get the pelvic girdle covered and the cervical uh, neck and improve those uh, muscles under the scapula that get tight and bothersome to you. So. So what are you talking your your range of motion is very slow intense coming up with your weight as you're working yeah yeah I'll, you're, I'll, not, you're not taking and doing right, this right yeah no you know like so, if I do that my muscle started that action but the momentum carried that across the floor so doing this if you're if you're moving at this every every amount you move faster you take away 
Uh, but more importantly, weights can't cause injury. Only acceleration forces. Acceleration forces, if you understand these, there's only three, there's only three directions that will hurt you. One is a quick start. The, 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 the guy who blows, the sprinter who blows his Achilles tendon out coming out of the start, or the softball player uh, that tries to hit the ball and take off after, you know, his warm up. Or the baseball pitcher who tears his rotator cuff, he's actually stopping his arm suddenly. So quick starts, quick stops, but worst are the rotational. And this, you see, walking to the gym, you're going to see this all the time. The ratchets. You, you, need, to, you need to always stay in, in motion in whatever you do. Don't turn under load ever. So those are those, those are that. So yeah, slow, it's controlled, slow, steady, control. And within 90 seconds, you want to pick a resistance load, and you pick lighter to, to go through the process to learn. You pick a weight load that causes you to reach momentary exhaustion. You can't finish a, 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 a repetition with like around 90 seconds. So with a 20 second rep, you're talking five, six, seven, eight reps max. Then you increase the resistant loads two to five percent. The volume, the, the, the intensity of the time of exercise should never increase. If anything, it should decrease. The more you, you have sets with your reps in? One set, one set of 90 seconds, and then you move. And there's, we've got probably eight or nine different things from negative onlys to uh, uh, some, some breakdown stuff. I just started doing some unilateral stuff. But you go, it's pretty much just up, down, slow, till you can't move anymore. We put it, and we have uh, software in all the rooms. So we put all those time into loads. We just... Every time you come in, we just pop your workout card. We know where you left off at three days earlier or seven days later and, and so forth and so on. So anybody, if anybody wants to see a couple of movements, yeah, I can show you. Yeah, to do a volunteer to work with Mike for a little bit. But, um, <laughs> um, He's always a good guy. Do you want to do it last week? Come on up. Yeah, come on. We'll come up. I won't, I won't kill you off too bad. Like I said, also, so another thing that we do too, so you come into our uh, facility and we set up your nutrition, your wellness plan. Are you next to Great Harvest? Uh, in, in Liberty Lake, yeah. 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 And then in the Riverstone, we're next to the Riverstone Dental and then uh, Chow Mambas and Hayden. But, uh, and anyway, we also have uh, technologies that within 2% track your hydration levels, your fat and muscle. Every one of our clients has their own personalized website so that you can track your time and what's going on and we can make adjustments along the way. It's kind of like monitoring your finances. Helps us, Lynn, to work. Yeah, if you, if you want. And my name's on your call. You know, you're welcome to call any one of them or you're welcome to email me or call me if you want to ask questions. I, okay, come on up. When's the last time you've exercised? Every day I did today. Okay, what'd you do today? Yoga and weights. Okay, what'd you do for weights? Push the lawnmower. You pushed the lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> I just free weights. Just okay, you didn't have a, did nothing specific. Okay, um, have you ever done body squats before? Well, it's like a squat. Here's a great example too. Here, here's the difference. Just to give you a quick snapshot of what I'm talking about. If you want, you don't have bad knees, stand up and just go up and down like this a couple times. And then do it like this. <laughs> And then when you get down to the 90 degrees, you have to start. See, our bodies are built. Here's how it is. We seek pleasure. We avoid pain. And when it starts to get difficult, your subconscious is going to start trying to lie to you. And it's going to say, bail, bail, bail. I don't want to do this. This is a near-death experience. And, and it is. <laughs> you have to threaten the body because if the signal isn't significant to the threat, it's like a suntan, it ain't going to do anything, right? So you say, you say absolutely resoundly that uh, you have to change body, you know? So I'm going to take you through a squat. So I'm going to have you stand here and be, um, feet shoulder width apart. And, and by the way, I joke about how hard this is, but if you, if you get dizzy and nauseated, you don't feel good, just stop, okay? Um, and then I'm going to have you hold my pinkies. Don't squeeze my hands though, because your blood pressure will rise. All right? I'll hold you up, I promise. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine, you know, you're always going to sit up tall and look straight at me, and then you're going to imagine there's a little bar stool right behind you, okay? Now, I want you to take, in visually in your head, I want you to have a clock, I want you to go 10 seconds down, okay? Last thing, too, is I want you to keep the face as stoic as you can. If you close your eyes, it's okay. And I want you to breathe like this. Relax the face. From the back of the throat, I want you to, like that, okay? Holding your breath can cause Valsalva, which can trigger stroke and kill you. So don't hold your breath when you do anything. All right, come on down. The 10. That's how most people die, by the way. Monday morning in the toilet. There you go. All right, lean back down. You're wiser today, huh? I'm glad I came along. All right, keep going down, down. Keep coming down a little deeper. A little deeper. 
You're going to lean back away from me just a little and keep sinking down just a little lower. I want you to bring your rear end just below that knee. Now freeze real for about three seconds. Now using your arch and your heel only, don't use your toes. I want you to slowly push up six to eight seconds. Wonderful job. That is awesome. Now right there, I want you to turn. Don't lock out, come down now. Go again. We're going to repeat this six or eight times. <laughs> and if you'll trust me, I'll take you all the way. Come on down. Sink down a little lower. Now I want you to slowly come out. Now keep your hands out in front of you a little bit. You're doing awesome. Now you can breathe about every second. Just turn a little engine that could. Go ahead and come back down. Go down right away. Good. I know where the rest spots are. No pain, no pain. No pain, no pain. I love that commercial. Turn nice and slow. I'm still looking for that device. <clears throat> All right, don't point your hands. Just use your heels. You're doing a wonderful job. Bring your arms out in front. You can do it. Turn, come back down, go back down again. Go back down. Stay with me. <laughs> Stay with me. Yeah, you're doing great. You're doing a great job. We're going to come in. Turn slowly now. Oh now begin God. to speed up a little bit, but don't pull on your arms. Keep your hands out front. You're going to bog down a little bit. You're starting to run out of strength. Go back down quickly. We've got one more time again. Okay. Turn. Since this is your first time, I want you to oh. stop. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. I'm going to lower you to the floor. Are you ready? Okay. Lean away from me. Straighten out your arms. Now lean away from me and slowly sit down to the ground. Lean back. Don't twist your knees together. That's enough for today. Normally, I would have kept you on for about another minute. Okay. okay. Go ahead and lay back on your back. <laughs> I, that is good. No, no. We're not done. <laughs> um, just, just roll over to the to put your face on that so you can breathe on not the carpet. I don't want you to clean their carpets with your mouth. We're gonna do some push-ups. Okay. I'm gonna work your chest and triceps. Now, bring your hands to the corner here, right and left. And now I want you to weight on your thighs but not your kneecaps. Bring your ankles up, we're gonna cancel. Sorry about that. You kick that one up. Yeah, kick, go ahead and cross one foot over there. That just cancels body torque out a little bit. Now bring your hands down just a little lower. Okay. Women have flexible spine, so don't try to bow in the middle, okay? Try to stay stiff, look straight to the floor, and I want you to use your palms, and I want you to take 60 seconds to push up. Ready? Begin to push slow. Build the force up slowly. Go back down. Good job. Now, deeper stretch. Now, go really slow. Take, go real slow. Take your time. Not a lot. Keep breathing. I love your breathing. You picked up on it right away. A little higher. Now, turn real slow. Come down nice and easy. A little slower. Good. We're going to really make those muscles do all the work. Turn slowly. This is for demo, so we'll just do a few more. Okay, turn. You got great form. Turn, Verity. <laughs> turn really slow. There's a machine for push-up. Turn nice and slow. Pick, pick each other up a little bit. Now hold right there, don't move. Bring it down a little bit. Bring your hips up a little. And that's enough for today. That's good. This is for demo. Now, you are, you're one of the better subjects I've ever had. That's awesome. The guy, yeah, well, guys go, cool, dang, I ain't doing that. I'm out of here. That was awesome. Now, uh, so, so, but, no, 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 you, you're fine. You're fine. I got some more if you want it, but no. Yeah. But well, in about about three minutes, you can kind of see that if we were doing that for 15 minutes, the highest record the highest recorded heart rates ever during research were doing this. They had to they had, the, when they came up with the 15 minute range, it was because they realized that that t was too much of a dose for if you carried it out too long. And so, matter of fact, you'll be in your cardiovascular heart rate zone for three, four, five hours after you've done training in 15 minutes. So uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's a great fat burning as well. Now I know we're talking about bone mass, but here's one of my favorite things is like, okay, you, my doctor doesn't tell me to drink more beer to make my liver better. Huh? I know it is yours. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I want to find that doctor. And I know. Yeah. Yeah. My other my doc, my my doctor doesn't tell me to read more to make my eyes better. So why does your, your GP tell you to get on the treadmill, pump your heart more to make it stronger? Using an organ doesn't mean necessarily mean a change. You can get a skill change, you can get a efficiency change. You need to actually change the horsepower in your body, right? What comes first, weak heart or weak muscles? Your cardiovascular health, probably the weak muscles and the cardiovascular health came in line, right? Why would you need to keep that efficient, the system efficient? So your body doesn't know if it's biking, hiking, running, jogging, it does no work, it does no intensity, and all the research coming out is the same thing with cardiovascular improvements. You've got to train hard. The problem with doing cardiovascular in a hard met format is you put a lot more stress in the joints. But anyway, anyway, you slice it today coming out of here, you have to train with some intensity. You have to have some purpose, focus, and do so. So, any more questions?
You guys are great. Cheap Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> I've been dealing with that a lot lately today. Not, not.